All right, time to go again. This time we are going to learn a bit more about lambdas and streams. They've been there for a while, but this is taking it beyond the basics. We're going further this time. Please give a warm welcome to Simon Ritter. Thank you very much. So let's start with a show of hands, and I can just about see people. So um, who here has used JDK 8? OK, very good. Who here has tried streams and lambdas? OK, very good. So I have the right audience. What I'm going to do with this is really to help you, hopefully, to understand a bit more about lambdas and streams, which is why I've called it Beyond the Basics. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes at the beginning just recapping the basics of lambdas and streams so that we know where we're at. But then the idea is to help you by learning from my mistakes. And there's, there's a very nice phrase that I, I tend to use. Oh, hang on, it's not going to work. OK, let's try that. OK. Appears that my slides do not want to go forward. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. So now this seems to have frozen up completely. Oh, let's try that again. Okay, let's see if that... Oh, good. That now works. Right. So there's, there's this wonderful phrase, a clever man learns from his mistakes. A wise man learns from other people's. So that is what we're going to do. You are going to learn from my mistakes. Because... I have spent a lot of time programming, as I'm sure most of you have, but my background is very much from programming in C and being a procedural imperative programmer, and then moving to Java and being an object-oriented imperative programmer. And so when it comes to using lambdas and using streams effectively, you need to understand about functional programming. And I have no background in functional programming before JDK 8. So I have learned a lot about lambdas and streams and how to use them effectively as I have gone on with the code. So let's just take a couple of minutes, as I say, to recap on lambdas and streams so we know exactly what we're dealing with. Now the first thing is lambda expressions. The key thing about lambda expressions is it's about enabling you to have parameterized behavior in a much simpler way than it was before. Because in JDK 7 and earlier, if we wanted to create a new thread and we wanted to do some kind of work, if we didn't want to create a class which implemented the runnable interface, we could use an anonymous in a class which is kind of clunky and involves lots of boilerplate code and all sorts of things that just make it unwieldy. So we end up with something like this, where we have to say it's a new runnable, we've got braces, we have to specify exactly that it's a run method and it's a public and it's a void and all this sort of stuff in order to do some stuff. So with a Lambda expression, since everybody here has used Lambda expressions, you know what I'm talking about, it's much simpler we reduce that into, in effect, an anonymous function. So we're now saying that the parameters we're passing to this anonymous function are no parameters, empty brackets, and what we want to do in the body of that anonymous function is do some stuff. So it's a nice, succinct way of having our code execute and actually express what we want to do. Now, one of the other things about Lambda expressions is that in JDK 8, a large part of the compiler was rewritten so that the compiler could make better use of type inference, and it could figure out what types were without you having to state them explicitly. If we look at this as an example, what we've got here is a sort method, and it's a generic sort method. It has a generic type parameter t. And what we're going to do is we're going to pass a list of type t to that, and we're going to pass a comparator, which uses wildcards to say it's a, a parameter which is something which is superclass of t. OK. Now, if we want to use that, what we can do is we can say, OK, let's take a list. In this case, it's a list of type string and get that from somewhere. And then we want to sort it. 
So we'll call our sort method, and we'll pass the list in, and then we need to create a comparator. Comparator is a functional interface, so we can use a lambda expression to represent it. In this case, we're going to pass two parameters, string x, string y, and we're going to return the difference in length of those strings. So we're going to sort our strings by length. So that's all very good, but the compiler is now smarter. The compiler can look at that and say, ah, well, I know that list is of type string. String is a final class, so in terms of the comparator, it must be a comparator of type string. So we don't need to explicitly state that x and y are of type string. We can leave that out, and the compiler will fill in for us the fact that both x and y are strings. What this gives is something which sometimes people get a little bit concerned about, because they think, oh, hang on, are we sneaking dynamic typing into Java? And the answer is no, this is still fully statically typed. There's no avoidance of the fact that these things are strings, it's just that the compiler is filling it in for you. And the way we like to say that this works is that we're actually getting more typing with less typing. And that's a terrible pun which relies on the English language having multiple meanings for the same word. Functional interfaces. This is the places where you can use lambda expressions. So a functional interface is, by its very definition, an interface. And the key point about a functional interface is that it can only have one abstract method. In JDK 7 and earlier, this was pretty simple to recognize a functional interface, should you actually be able to use one. If you look at things like action listener, there's only one method. Therefore, it's an abstract method, and it must be an abstract uh, functional interface. In JDK 8, it gets a little harder to recognize what is a, a functional interface. The reason for this is because in JDK 8, in addition to introducing lambda expressions, there was also the inclusion of default methods in interfaces. And what this does is provides you with a way of having multiple inheritance of behavior as well as multiple inheritance of types. It's not complete multiple inheritance in Java because there's no multiple inheritance of state, but you do now have multiple inheritance of behavior. In addition to that, we also allow you to use static methods in interfaces. So that's a change between JDK 7 and JDK 8. So you can have as many default methods, as many static methods as you like in an interface, but in order for it to be functional, there must be only one abstract method. And if you want to, you can use the annotation functional interface and have the compiler check for you that your interface actually does have just one abstract method. Now, when it comes to streams, the key point about this is that what we're really dealing with, and this is where we start getting into the functional approach, is a pipeline of operations. And the structure of that pipeline is that at one end, we have a source, a source of the elements that we're going to process through this pipeline. We pass that source of elements to zero or more intermediate operations. An intermediate operation is one that takes as input a stream, does something, and generates as output a stream. That way you can feed the output of one intermediate operation to the input of another. You can chain them together as many times as you like and do whatever processing is required by your code. Once you've done all the processing in the intermediate stages, you need to generate some kind of result. You need to have the other end of your pipeline. And that uses a terminal operation. Terminal operation takes as input a stream, but doesn't generate as output another stream. It might generate a list, it might generate a single result, or it may generate no results at all. But it could have a side effect. And the side effect, in this case, is something like printing a result, printing a message. So if we look at a simple example of that, I've got a set of transactions here that I want to process. So in order to do that, I need to get my source, so I call the stream method on that, and then I do a filter where I use a lambda expression 
to define how I want to filter it. So this is our behavior in the parameter. And we say we want to get all the buyers who were in the city that was London. We pass the results of that, which is a stream of buyers who were in London, to the map to int method. Why did that do that? No. Anybody know how to switch between <laughs> modes? No? Command X. Thank you. Swap displays. Yes, let's see. Thank you very much, whoever that was. <laughs> oh, Kirk. <laughs> right. Hang on. There we go. Back to there. Yeah. So then we pass it into map to int, where we want to map from the buyers who were in London to a price associated with that transaction. We get a stream of integer values, and then we pass that into sum, which is our terminal operation that adds up all those values and then returns it as a total. There are a number of ways that you can get stream sources. So there's clearly the stream method on collection. You can also have a parallel stream, which will use the fork join framework underneath and split the work up into a number of parallel streams and have them execute in parallel. If you have an array, that is a form of collection, but because it's not a collection object, you can actually turn it into a stream using the arrays.stream method, or you can use stream.of and pass a, an array of values to that. There's also some useful static factories, things like intstream.range, files.walk, that allows you to go from a certain point in your file system and just uh, have a stream of directories and files from there. And in, in terms of terminal operations, it's quite important to understand some of what happens there. Even though it appears that you have these streams being passed from intermediate operation to intermediate operation and so on, that's not actually the way it works underneath. Underneath, all these things are merged into a single set of operations to optimize the efficiency of how these things happen. So if you're doing something like a find first, what you're not going to do is pass all the elements from your source through a filter, pass it all the way through a map, and then look to see when you find the first one. You'll pull each one through the whole pipeline as it's required, and then when you get the, to the find first, that returns positive, so you actually got the first result, then you can stop processing at that time. So you don't have to process everything in the stream. There's also a number of optimizations that happen underneath in terms of the way that the streams are classified so that you can have things like saying a stream is distinct. We know that the stream doesn't contain any duplicate elements. If you pass a distinct stream through the unique uh, or distinct method, then it's not going to do anything. It's going to avoid doing extra work. So let's look at a little bit at some of the details about how we can use these Lambda expressions and streams in effective ways. Now, one of the things is delayed execution. And this is, this is a classic sort of problem that we have. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle applied to software. Now, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle for the physicists amongst us is all about quantum mechanics. And it's the idea that the act of observing something changes what you're observing. But this also applies quite often to software. And we get something like this where you've got a logger, and we're going to call the finest method on that, and we need to pass the message to that method. So we call a method called get some data. Now, get some data could be a very heavyweight operation. It could take a long time to process whatever's needed to return that particular message. And the problem with this is that even if you set the log level to info, it still has a performance impact. Because regardless of what the logging level is, in order to call that method, you're always going to call get some status data. It's going to generate the result and then pass it to logger.finest. So only when it gets to logger.finest that the logging API is going to go, oh, we're at level info. We don't need this message, so we'll just return. So you've still had the overhead of actually creating that message. So the logger determines whether it's required or not. 
and regardless of whether it's required or not, you're still generating the message. In JDK 8, what's happened is that the logging APIs have been modified. There's now new versions of all the logging methods like finest, finer, and so on, which now take a supplier. A supplier is a functional interface. And as the name would suggest, it supplies a result. But the important thing about this is that it actually doesn't give you the result. It gives you a description of how to create the result. If we take our example there, logger.finest get some status data, we can change that very, very subtly into a Lambda expression. So now we're saying, rather than using get some status data to generate that message directly, use a Lambda expression to represent the supplier. Supplier doesn't take any, in the case of the, the method, it doesn't take any arguments, so we have empty brackets. And the body of that Lambda expression will be to get some status data. When we call logger.finest, we pass the Lambda expression to the logger. The logger then says, if we're at level info, we don't need to do anything, it returns. It hasn't used get some status data. If the logging level is at finest, then it goes, ah, we need to call the supplier, it uses the method, calls it, get some status data is called, and we generate the message. So it avoids the, the overhead. And it really is about having a way to describe how to create that message, not actually the message. So if the logger doesn't need the value, it doesn't invoke the lambda. And you can use this in other places as well. So if, if you've got things where there's a conditional on whether you use the parameter that's been passed to the method, and you don't want to have the overhead of actually doing whatever's required to create that parameter in the first place, pass it as a lambda expression using a supplier, and then decide whether you need it or not at that time. So the next thing that we want to talk about is avoiding loops in streams. Now, this is where we start getting into the difference between functional and imperative programming. The thing with functional programming is that you really shouldn't modify state. That's one of the key things about functional programming is do not modify state. You should have a function which returns the same result regardless of how many times you call it with the same input value. So there should be no state involved which might alter the result if you call it with the same input value. Now, the other thing about Java is that in terms of Lambda expressions and anonymous inner classes before that, what Java does is it supports closures over values, not closures over variables. And this is quite an important thing because it restricts how you can access variables in the surrounding scope. In anonymous inner classes, you had to mark any variable that you accessed within an anonymous inner class from the surrounding scope as final. Its value could be set once and once only. You couldn't modify it within the anonymous inner class. In Lambda expressions, the same rule still really applies in that you can't modify the state of a variable in the surrounding scope, but you don't explicitly have to mark it as being final. But it must be effectively final which means it behaves the same whether it's marked final or not. So its value is only set once. The problem with this is that state is very useful. As Java programmers, we use state all the time, and state is good. Now, here's an example of some code that I wrote. So I set about thinking to myself, OK, we've got lambdas in uh, JDK 8, we've got streams. What I wanted to do is find a list of all the places where you could either have a source of a stream or you had a, a method that took a parameter that was a functional interface, so I could use a Lambda expression there. What I did was I actually wrote some code and I went through all the, the APIs and I found all the places where there were functional interfaces being used as parameters and all the methods that returned a stream as a source. I built that up as a list. In fact, I built it up as a hash table. And then I wanted to print out the sort of summary results. 
And I thought, well, you know, I'm using lambdas and streams. I'm going to use lambdas and streams to find lambdas and streams. Great. So I had my hash map, and I thought, right, what I want to do is I want to count how many methods there are that return a stream. So the hash table that I had basically had the key as being the name of the class, and then the values associated with that class was a list of method names. In order to do that and count them up, I thought, right, what I'll do is I'll use a stream from the, the key set of the hash map, and then I'll use the for each method. So that I'm going through each class that I have, and then I'm looking at to see whether the um, the number of methods that I've got associated with that, I want to add those things up in order to create a total. So I thought, hmm, right, state. This is important. So I'm going to be clever here, because I know that I can't modify the state in a, a variable from the surrounding scope. So what I'll do is I'll use a long adder. A long adder was a new variable or new class that was introduced in JDK 8. And it was designed specifically for this sort of situation. The idea of a long adder is that if you have a situation where you've got multiple threads all trying to modify a single variable, obviously you need locking to avoid inconsistent data. That can be expensive. And if you've got a situation where you've got multiple threads that are frequently reading from something, but not frequently, sorry, they're frequently writing to something, but not frequently reading from it, then you don't need to really lock it. What you can do is you can say, OK, let's give each thread its own copy of the variable. Because they're frequently writing to it, they can write to it independently. And then when you need to read from it, which you're going to do infrequently, you bring all those results together and generate a single result. So this is, this is you know, this should be perfect. This should be ideal. So that's what I did. I said, right, let's create a long adder, and then I'll have my for each, and I'll say, OK, I'll use a lambda expression, and I'll say that for each element, take the, the elements that I've got associated with that class, which is the methods, take the count of that, and add it to my long adder. Great. Solves the problem. Everything works. So I showed this to one of the engineers at Oracle, because I was working at Oracle at the time. He said, oh, no, that's, that's not functional. That's, that's not the way to do it. So I, I kind of went away, and I thought, OK, I'll have another go at that. And the functional way to do that is like this. So now, rather than having a variable, even if it's a long adder, which is one that's designed for this sort of situation, what we do is we say, OK, take the stream and then map to int. So we want to map from the, the elements that we have in the hash table, the classes, map that to an integer which represents the number of methods associated with that class. That gives us a stream of integer values, which are the counts of all the methods for each class. Pass that into sum, which adds up all those values in the stream, and gives us a single result. So now we have a nice, pure, functional way of doing this. So then there was a, a, another thing that I wanted to do, which is a bit more complicated. Similar kind of idea, but a bit more complicated. In this case, what I wanted to do was I wanted to print out all the, the methods that could use functional interfaces. And I also wanted to keep a count of how many of them were new in JDK 8. So I'm trying to do two things at the same time. And again, I use the same approach as I did before, which is to use a long adder. But this time, I needed a slightly more complex lambda expression, the body of the lambda expression. So here I've got a block of code where I'm saying, OK, output, well, print out each of the methods as it goes past, and then check to see whether it's a new method in that class, and if it is, add one to the, the count of new methods. And we get the count of new methods. And again, the engineer said, no, that's not the functional way to do it. So I thought, right, I'll have another crack at it. And I did this. I thought, OK, I used map to int last time. I'll use map to int this time. So I said, OK, map to int. But this time, rather than having state outside, I'll have a variable inside the lambda expression. So I've got new method 
which will be set to zero initially. I print out the method, and then I look to see if this is a new method, and if it is, I set new method to one. What that gives me is a stream of zeros and ones to indicate whether or not these are new methods. Pass that into sum and get my result. Now, this is, this is fine, you see, because I can make this parallel, and I don't have to worry about the fact that the, the new method variable is state, because being within a lambda expression, um, it's isolated. But, of course, the problem is it's still not purely functional. There's still state being modified within the lambda expression, so we shouldn't do this. So we need another way of doing it. So then I went away and thought about it again, and I looked at some of the documentation, and I came up with this. So now what we do is we say, okay, rather than doing it as one step, we'll do it as two steps, and we'll use this really handy little method called peak. What peak does is it takes the input stream and it simply passes it directly to the output stream. But it allows you to look at the objects of the stream as they go past and do something with them. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, take the stream, as the elements go past, print out their values. So that handles the idea of printing what we need. Then we'll pass it to map to int, where we can use the isNew method and we'll use the, the kind of tertiary operator, so we're not involving any state at all, and then we either return zero or one. Great, so now we've got no state involved, we've got two-step process, this is all good, isn't it? No. Problem is that apparently, if you have side effects in your functional code, and printing is a side effect, then that's not purely functional. So even though there's no state involved, we have a side effect, so we're not, strictly speaking, functional. So I went away and I actually asked the engineer, I said, well, okay, so I look at this, I can't think of a different way of doing it. You know, I want to print the message out, how do I do it? He said, ah, what you need is an IO monad. And I'm like, okay, I'm done. This is good enough. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is the art of reduction, or the need to think differently, again. Now, what I did when I, when I was at Oracle, we used to run lambdas and streams hands-on labs. And so we put together a number of exercises that were designed to help people understand how to use these things. One of them was a fairly simple exercise. It was the idea that you have a file which contains lines of text. What you want to do is to find the length of the longest line in the file using lambdas and streams. And the hint that we give to people is that the buffered reader class in JDK8 has a nice new method called lines. And what that will do is it will return you a stream of the lines of text in your file. Great. So the solution to this is actually very trivial. You simply say, OK, use your buffered reader, create a stream source by calling lines, pass that to map to int, so you map the, the lines of text into the length of the lines of text, pass that into max as your terminal operation to give you the maximum value, and then because that returns an optional, because we don't know if there are going to be any elements in the stream, so we return an optional, we need to get the value from that, so we just do get as int. And that will give us the, the length of the longest line in the file. So it's great, okay, wonderful. But then I was doing this, and somebody came up to me, and he said, okay, well, that, that's very nice. What if we change the problem a bit? What if we say, find the longest line in a file? Not the length of the longest line, find the longest line in a file. And so this was, this was quite a while ago, and I, I thought to myself, ooh, okay, how do I do that? I started thinking about it in terms of using streams, using lambdas. And I came up with a solution, which I call the naive stream solution. And this is what it was. I said, okay, we want, to take the, we want to find the longest line. Let's take our lines from the file. Let's pass them into sort. And we'll sort them by length with longest first. Then we'll pass that to find first, which will simply give us the, the first element from that stream, which will be the longest line in the file. And then, because that returns an optional, we simply call get to get the value. 
So yeah, great. That works. Job done. I'm good. No, not really. Because if you think about it, that's probably the most inefficient way you could possibly do that. Because you're going to have to read in all the data, you're going to have to sort it, it's going to be involving lots and lots of time, it's going to involve lots and lots of resources, especially if you've got a very big file. So that really isn't the optimal solution to this particular problem. So I thought, okay, there must be a better approach to this using functional programming. So I kind of went back to basics, and I thought to myself, okay, if I was doing this without functional programming, if I didn't use lambdas and streams, how would I do it? I'd do it like this. You know, it's very simple. I create a variable called longest, which has an empty string in it. Then I have a while loop, which simply reads each line from the file until we get to the end of the file. For each line in the file, we look to see if the length of the string that we've just read is longer than the longest string we already have. If it is, we change the reference. At the end of that loop, we have the longest line in the file. Great. Four lines of code. So you think, well, that, that's, that's easy. Why do I need functional programming? Well, the answer is yes, it's simple, but the key point here is it's inherently serial. You know, we have this for loop. We have defined the, the way that the code must execute because we know how a for loop works. So we must execute the code like that. We can't make this parallel, even if we wanted to. We also have a problem of it not being thread safe because we have this mutable state. So longest is our variable. We're, we're mutating it as we go through. So even if we could separate that loop up and do it in a different way and have parallel execution, we'd still have the problem of mutatable state and locking and things like that. So then I thought, right, let's do a bit more research on functional programming and understand a bit more about how that works. And if you look at functional programming, you find that a lot of it is based on what's called lambda calculus, hence the name of lambda expressions in JDK 8. And that, that's really kind of a mathematical approach. But what it relies on a lot is the idea of recursion. So if you want to do a loop in your code, rather than using an explicit loop, you use recursion to do that. And this is actually a very good uh, sort of interview question, is to give somebody a, a simple loop and then say, well, okay, if you wanted to do that same thing without using a loop and without using a variable, how would you do it? And obviously the answer is recursion. So I wrote this bit of code, just as a sort of learning experience. So I said, okay, let's write a recursive method that will take our set of strings and give us the longest string from that. So I've got this method, which takes a string as a parameter, which is the longest string we've found so far, it takes a list, which is all the strings we're analyzing, and it takes an integer i, which is the index, into that list as to where we've got in terms of our search. And then, not going into too much detail, but that basically we recursively call this, uh, the blue line is where we recursively call it, if we haven't got to the end of the, the uh, list. So for each element in the array, what we basically, or the list, what we basically do is say, okay, Look at the longest line that we found so far, compare it against the next one in the list, and decide which is the longer of the two, keep that, and then recursively call it so we maintain the state by using recursion. At the end, we check to see which is the longest, return that, that will kind of bubble all the way back up, and we get our result. If we want to use that, then we can read all the lines from our file into an array list, and then we simply call find longest, line, find longest string with an empty string as our starting point, the lines that we want to read and, and test, and then start at index zero. Great. So now we've got a different approach. We've got one that doesn't have an explicit loop. There's mo no mutable state, so presumably we're all good. Well, no, because of course, if you've got a large number of lines, every time you read another line, you're generating another stack frame, and you know, you're probably going to hit an out-of-memory exception reasonably quickly because you're, you're just using up so much memory. So it's, it's not, not the best way to do it. But we have learned from this. So in order to discover a better stream solution, what we need to do is use the approach that Streams has. Now, fundamentally, Streams is all about filter, map, reduce. 
where you can you know, reduce the amount of data you've got by filtering it, you can map it into different forms, and then you can reduce it into a single result based on whatever you want to do. In terms of this problem, what we're dealing with here is we don't need to bother with filtering. We don't need to bother with mapping. We just need to reduce all the lines in the file into one line, which is the longest one. OK. So if we look closely at the reduce method in the stream class, what we'll find is that reduce, the method signature, takes a binary operator as a parameter. And the binary operator is called the accumulator. And that will return an optional of type T. And if you look at binary operator, what you find is it's a subclass of by function. By function is a function that takes two inputs and generates a signal output. And in the case of by function, you can have different types for the parameters and the return type. Binary operator, all the types are the same. So you have two objects of the same type, and you return an object of the same type. So the key that we need to kind of use to unlock this puzzle is to find the right accumulator. Now, if you look at the description of the accumulator in the API documentation, what it says is that the accumulator takes a partial result and the next element and returns a new partial result. So this should seem familiar, because when we did our recursion, that's pretty much what we did. We took our partial result and the next element, and we recalled, we called our method recursively. So this is essentially the same thing. What we're not doing here, which we did in our recursive approach, was to generate lots of stack frames and have the overhead of creating a new list in order to make this work. So we end up with this. So now we say that we take the, the reader, we generate a stream source, lines, and then we do a reduction. We use the reduce method, and we pass an accumulator into that, so our, our binary operator. Binary operator takes two parameters, x and y, and again, because of type inference, the compiler will know these are strings, and we simply return which is the longer of those two strings. The key point here is x, because x, remember, is the partial result. So x is what actually maintains the state for us. So it's, it's within the stream. We're not doing it by doing recursion, but the stream code underneath is maintaining the state for us. We don't see it explicitly in our code, but x gives us the partial result that we have, and then y gives us the next element in the in the list. So I went to, I went to my, my favorite engineer, Stuart Marks, and I said, look, I have done this. It is wonderful. I have done a reduction. I've gone through this whole process. And he went, yeah, that's really nice, except there's a much easier way of doing it. So <laughs> what you can do is you can simply go, ah, OK, use max. And rather than using max, which takes a stream of ints as an input, you can use max, which takes a comparator as a parameter. And you can say, OK, do reader.lines, pass it into max, where you compare each of the elements based on the length. And then that will give you the longest element in that, comparing them by length. So it's just an interesting sort of um, approach in terms of understanding how functional programming works and then looking at the documentation. So let's talk a little bit in the, the got a little bit of time left. Um, about what's happening in the future with lambdas and streams, because there's a few things which are being added to JDK 9, which will make life even easier for us when it comes to using streams and, and lambda expressions. Most of them are around adding new APIs. So one of the things that's going to be added, or has already been added, if you go and look at the early builds of JDK 9, is that the optional class now has a stream method associated with it. And this is kind of interesting, because when I've done descriptions of optional, I've always kind of described optional as being a stream which has either zero or one element in it. And so now you can actually treat it that way. And if you call stream on an optional, what you'll get is a stream that has either zero or one element in it, depending on whether there is a value associated with that optional. There's also a new method on, in the collectors 
class, this is a, a bunch of utility methods, which is flat mapping. And what that will allow you to do is to generate a collection, but use a function which will allow you to map from the values that you have to different values. And because it's flat mapping, you can potentially create multiple values for each value on the input stream. So if you had, for example, um, your input stream as lines of text, you could use flat mapping in terms of your collection and separate them into individual words and then collect those into a list. So you could do that as a single step rather than having to go through flat map as a step within your stream and then pass that into your collect using collect a list. A uh, few other places where there, there are some uh, support for streams. So in terms of the, the matcher class, there's now the ability to get the results of that matcher, so pattern matching, as a stream. So you can get a stream of match results. Same with scanner. So there's now um, a way of doing find all based on either a pattern as a string or a pattern as a pattern object. And you will get a stream of match results of that. And then if you want to get access to the, the raw tokens in terms of the scanner, then you can do that as a stream of strings. Uh, a few other places where you can get stream sources from. There's um, in the network interface, you can now get the, uh, the addresses associated with an interface. You can get these sub interfaces. You can get the network interfaces, um, just kind of useful utility methods to get the, the various bits of networking information as streams. And then also in terms of permission collection, you can now get the permissions as a stream. Parallel support for files.lines. This is kind of an interesting one, because if you think about reading from a file, typically you're going to read it sequentially. But you might want to actually process in parallel to get better performance. So what this lines method on files will do is actually enable you to map the, uh, the file into memory, and then the stream source can be generated as a set of parallel sources by dividing up the, the, f the file memory map file into kind of blocks. And so what it will do is it will effectively split, uh, for every two threads, it'll split it in half based on the nearest line boundary, because obviously you can't split it exactly, because it might be halfway through a line. So it'll split it based on the nearest line boundary, and then use that set of lines as input to one of the threads that is executing in parallel. And if you look at the performance improvement on that, um, the left-hand side, you've got the, the kind of chart which shows how the buffered reader.lines method works. And so that, that's essentially either doing it in serial or parallel. <laughs> parallel is actually slower, which is kind of what you'd expect, really. Um, but if you use the files.line, because it memory maps the file rather than trying to do it in parallel and doing reads from the, the file, then you get much better performance. So if you're not worried about the order of the lines that you're reading from the file, then this can actually be something that will really improve performance. A couple of other things um, that have been added. There's um, stream.takeWhile. And this is kind of sort of loosely related to the sort of find first kind of thing. What this does is it says, have a predicate which defines what you're trying to, uh, uh, some sort of, uh, um, yeah, some predicate that you need to be true or false. And then what will happen is that the string source will be read until that predicate is true. So it will read all the initial elements of that stream until the predicate is satisfied, and then it will stop reading elements from that stream. So you take while the predicate is true. So just a very simple example here. Let's say I've got some uh, data coming from a, a reader, and I want to turn that into integers. And then I want to read all of the elements from that stream of results until I get something that's less than 56. So all those will be read, and then they'll be printed out. As soon as I get to 56 or higher, then the stream will stop. The, the one thing that you do need to think a little bit carefully about this is what happens if you've got an unordered stream. Because if you've got an ordered stream, so they're you know, um, 
linear in terms of their values, then that's OK. But if you've got an unordered stream, then you might get a situation where the stream will stop, even though values, subsequent values will actually still be within the predicate. So it's, it's just something to be aware of. And then the reverse of that is drop while. So rather than saying, keep taking elements from the stream until the predicate is, is satisfied, what it does is it says, ignore elements in that stream until the predicate is satisfied, and then start taking the elements from that. So if we take the same example, what we're going to do is we're going to ignore all the elements below 56, and when we hit one that's 56 or greater, then we'll start taking elements from the stream and carry on from there. So just to conclude, um, basically, lambdas provides us with a nice, simple way of parameterizing behavior. Streams API provides a nice functional style of programming in Java, which gives us a very powerful combination. But we do have to think differently. As traditionally imperative programmers, if you haven't done functional programming before, like me, then um, you know, think very carefully. Avoiding loops, the, the one thing I would say there is if you think of using for each in your stream, stop and think about it again. Do you really want to use for each? Is it really the right approach? Because quite often, unless you're doing something simple like printing out values in a, in a list, for example, then for each is not going to be the right approach. So think very carefully. If you've got any kind of mutation of state, any kind of like um, collection, anything like that, for each is not going to be the right thing to do. Think carefully about reductions and how they work. Like I say, partial result and the next element, figure out how to do things um, like that. Um, more to come in JDK 9, and th there's also some plans for things to go into JDK 10. And then I'm going to put a shameless plug here for the company that I work for now, which is um, Azul. And we have an open source version, well, in fact, it's open JDK build, which is called Zulu. So it's free. Um, we encourage people to use it. We have early access versions of JDK 9 already. Um, so go and have a look at that, zulu.org. And with that, I think I may have three minutes for questions. So if there are questions, so, uh, there's a question down the front there. You don't have to, at the front, at the front. There we go. So have you experienced problems with checked exceptions within the Lambda expressions when you're working with streams? So checked exceptions within Lambda expressions. Yeah, th this is one of those things which, um, and I, I did talk to Brian about this, which is that if you throw an exception within the, the Lambda expression that you're doing, and you're, doing, and you're using something like predicate or using you know, any of the, the standard classes, they don't have exceptions associated with them. So unfortunately, there's no easy way of doing that. You have to handle the exception within the Lambda code. It's, it's just the way that it works. So yeah, I, I, can't, I can't give you a better answer than that. You just have to handle the exception internally. Don't see any other hands. Oh, no, there's a, yeah, the back there. No, or the front. Uh, have you done any performance comparing between Lambda expression and the old traditional while uh, loop? Um, no, I haven't. Um, yeah, I have to admit, I haven't done a comparison of the performance between using a Lambda expression. Kirk, would you like to comment on that? Is a Lambda expression and a, a stream more effective than a, a for loop? Hmm? Identical. OK. So I guess the advantage there is that you can very easily make a stream parallel versus a for loop you can't. So was there, there was another. Did somebody put their hand up over there? Yeah. Oh, right, same question. Oh, same question, okay. <laughs> okay, well, I guess that's it. Well, thank you very much.